Hello, wherever this finds you today, I'm Jeremy Cowan, the editor and founder of Vanilla Plus. And welcome to Vanilla Plus's latest webinar in the Thought Leadership series. We've got a fascinating discussion for you today. It's on the business drivers and the benefits for operators of switching to real-time charging and focuses on the work of Matrix Software. Our key speaker today is one of the founders of Matrix Software, the CEO, Dave Labuda. And your other main speaker today is Dan Baker, an independent senior analyst at the Technology Research Institute, and I'm pleased to say a member of the advisory board to Vanilla Plus. Just by way of background, Dave was one of the founders of Portal Software, which was sold successfully to Oracle a few years back, and since then he has established Matrix Software, and we've featured him in several articles in Vanilla Plus magazine, so uh, you may have read his thoughts there. Anyway, gentlemen, welcome to you both. Thanks, Thank Jeremy. You. Now, before we start, I just have a quick reminder to all our delegates. This is, please remember, an interactive webinar in two ways. First, we're going to ask you in a while to take part in three anonymous polls, and we'll bring you the results immediately. Please remember, I can't see how you voted, and nor can our panel, so you can tell us exactly what you think. Second is there will be a question and answer session with Dave and Dan at the end. And you can send your questions in to me at any time. Just type them into the ask a question window, which you'll see on your screen. I will put as many of these as possible in the time available to our speakers. And I'll do this on your behalf at the end of the session. So let me have your questions at any time from now on. Now, without further delay, I'd like to hand the floor over to Dan Baker. Dan. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, delighted to be here. And, uh, uh, you know, whenever I'm invited to attend a, uh, and, and participate in a Vanilla Plus webinar, the first question I ask is, uh, what exactly would you like me to cover in my introduction? And uh, in this case, I mean, billing, charging, real-time, BSS is an awfully big landscape. But Matrix was very clear from the outset. They said, basically, look, Dan, in our side of the webinar, uh, Matrix will focus on the practical nitty-gritty issues of deploying and cost-justifying a real-time billing system. But to set up that conversation, uh, we need you to address the more basic question. Assuming we can get it affordable and easily deployed, is there an actual business case for real-time billing uh, in the first place? And it's great to get clear direction like that, and it's also nice and actually essential that you actually believe the business case you're being asked to make. And so, yes, I, I think there's an excellent case for uh, real-time billing, and that's what I'll cover in the next five slides or so. Okay, the first and maybe most obvious of the real-time uh, billing cases is for bill shock. Now, the notion of bill shock has been talked about so much in the press recently that it's, it's actually no longer shocking or a surprising issue anymore. And as most of you know, the European Union has put regulations in place that require operators to notify people when their data services reach a certain amount to prevent any unpleasant surprises at billing time. Interestingly enough, the regulator of the U.S. market, the Federal uh, Communications Commission, or FCC, is talking about bringing similar regulations here in North America. So bill shock regulation is becoming a worldwide issue. Now, the ironic thing about uh, uh, bill shock is that it's causing an equally alarming biller shock from the mobile operator community. You see, bill shock is not just a matter of figuring out uh, how many megabytes are being consumed. Yes, you can get a rough idea of what's happening to the mobile subscriber balance by faking it or metering the, the balance down using a simple usage formula. In fact, that's how many operators are getting by today. But that approach is merely a stopgap measure. It's not a long-term solution uh, because the rating can be very, very complicated, especially if the subscriber is roaming. And it's also critical that you know the precise time when the bill shock threshold is reached. For instance, if the bill shock limit is 50 euros, the operator simply stops billing the customer. But they don't cut the customer off from using the service. They are leaking all sorts of revenue if they can't. 
And that's the case as it is today because they don't have the real-time policy control mechanisms in place. Okay, if handling bill shock is one business case, another is certainly around the whole issue of convenience and providing real-time confirmation to people who are buying all sorts of things through their smartphones. The irony, of course, is that today's mobile convenience store is rather poorly equipped. I mean, imagine going to a, a, a real-life convenience store and there was a dog there where a cash register is supposed to be, and you can't even get a receipt in real time for the cup of coffee, coffee you just bought. Now, would you go back to that store, or would you take your business elsewhere? You know, I think the answer is obvious. So decrementing your balance or providing an advisive charge if it's a postpaid account is becoming the cost of doing business in mobile these days. People expect it, and after all, if they download a video, they have no idea how many megabytes they've consumed from that download. Now, this certainly complicates life for the billing department. I mean, for example, let's say the user tries to download a movie and he fails on his first three attempts. Without some real-time intelligence, you're liable to charge the customer four times for the same movie. Now, remember, too, that for a movie don download, uh, you, know, you as the operator are obligated to pay a royalty back to the movie studio or content company. And you're usually on the hook for that royalty payment regardless of whether you actually receive payment from the end user customer. So the stakes are high. On the one hand, you've got an angry customer. On the other hand, you're digging a hole for yourself by paying too much in royalties. So this is an example of the kind of real-time intelligence will increasingly be called upon, and especially when LTE arrives, and a lot of people are expecting great demand for high definition of videos, conference calls, and the like. Prepaid. It's a global phenomenon, and it's growing, and it's just not just in developing countries. I mean, in 2007, roughly 15% of U.S. cell phone subscribers had a prepaid plan. Now I understand that figure is up to 20%. When I visit my local Best Buy, uh, the largest electronics retail store in the U.S., about 50% of, the, of, the, 50 of the phones that they have on display to sell are prepaid phones. Now, of course, in countries like China and India, I mean, prepaid is growing at a massive pace and hybrid uh, prepaid and postpaid models are becoming even more prevalent. And when you think about the hundreds of millions of prepaid subscribers in Asia and Africa, I mean, you realize it won't be long before those customers are looking beyond SMS to using smartphones. And when that happens, uh, data usage is going to explode. So there's a gap here that needs to be closed. I mean, the current prepaid charging capability in many cases cannot handle some of the sophisticated business data plans and bundles that are coming to the mobile broadband world. Uh, you want to keep the prepaid as a money collecting approach, but at the same time introduce greater diversity in rating, discounting, bundling, and incentives. And I think real-time billing is the answer. As many of you know, uh, AT&T Mobility has had a monopoly on the distribution of the iPhone and iPad in the US market. But now, according to reports in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Verizon Wireless is set to now give AT&T a run for the money by offering the iPhone probably uh, beginning in, 19, in 2011. Now, as luck would have it, <clears throat> I had a chance to be a fly on the wall uh, during a conversation uh, recently between Randall Stevenson, the CEO of AT&T, and Steve Jobs from Apple. And this is what I heard. Uh, Randall starts speaking. Uh, Steve, uh, we just love your iPhone and iPod. I mean, it's allowed us to expand our business big time and even take market share from our arch competitor Verizon, especially in places like New York City that are smack in the middle of Verizon's territory. But times are getting tough for us, Steve. I mean, we're getting clobbered by the high cost of radio bandwidth serving your iPhone. What I'm trying to stay, say, Steve, is we need a bigger margin. Now, here's Steve Jobs in reply is what he said. Randall, I certainly appreciate the great work that AT&T has done for us in the past, but as you know, Verizon has entered the picture now, so you're no longer the only network game in town. Sorry to say, but Apple has worked itself into kind of an enviable position. I mean, we've got two dumb pipe, uh, two, two dumb pipe provider guys beating each other up over price and seeing who's, the, who's going to offer me the sweetest deal to access mobile bandwidth. Wow, I appreciate what you're saying, Steve. I mean, you're right. I mean, our knee-jerk reaction as a telco is always to throw bandwidth at our problems. Uh, and, and maybe that's why John Chambers you know, always shows up at our annual picnics. I mean, but, any, but anyway, Steve, I mean, hearing what you have to say has made me think. 
Actually, there are some guys offering some fancy new capabilities for our back office, things like real-time billing, network policy and control, and that would allow us to help you turn your dumb over-the-top service into something proprietary. You could actually charge a premium for services that incorporate things like presence, lifestyle bundles, or a higher QoS. What would you say if we were able to offer you those things, Steve? Premium service? Are you kidding me? I mean, you're talking my language, Randall. I mean, Apple loves premiums. I mean, when we planned our Apple store in Boston, I made sure it was right across the street from Gucci. I mean, high fashion, a first class, exclusivity, I mean, that's our appeal. Hmm, uh, you know, maybe I should consider, reconsider your request. I mean, what are those new capabilities going to be online, Randall? Okay, I, I hope you enjoyed my little game here. But, I mean, the point is I think that uh, the media providers and the, and the big guys that are uh, making the decisions on content, um, you know, they see the value for telecoms going forward as offering something that adds value to their over-the-top the, over service, which is essentially dumb. It doesn't have any intelligence to it. And that's enabled by things like real-time billing and policy control. And it may be, of course, that telecoms leverage these capabilities not just through partners, but by offering services of their own. Anywhere you look at it, you know, if the road to value is offering a premium services, then treating some customers better than others is key. If I'm a high-value customer, I should be the last one on the list to be throttled when there's scarce bandwidth. And to make those kinds of decisions, you need real-time charging, which inherently understands the value of the subscriber. And finally, the last point I'd like to make is, you know, the ultimate goal of where this real-time billing is going to lead. And I think it parallels something developed in the airline industry called yield management, which is really the law that says the price of an airline ticket is a floating thing that will vary by when it's purchased, the number of airline seats available, and a hundred other factors. Well, in the telecom industry, you know, yield management goes by another, another name. It's really what we would call uh, revenue optimization, which really falls under the general category of revenue assurance. In either case, airline or telecom, you're dealing with a product that has a very short, uh, short shelf life. The bandwidth capacity that exists right now is gone in an instant, and you have to constantly fill that pipe with usage and your pockets with money for renting that usage. And you must not only have the billing mechanisms in place to get paid for the use of expenses and scarce radio network capacity, you need to analyze where in terms you are as far as profitability goes. And so we're moving to a world where you're going to have much better control over the cost of the services you introduce. You'll know, that you're, you'll know what your true billing and network costs are, and you'll be able to balance that against the revenue you get from very granular segments of the marketplace. And increasingly, increasingly you're going to measure the profitability of a network service in real time and modify your marketing and your rollout strategies quickly as well. So I think revenue optimization and real-time billing are, are the th type of things that mobile operators are going to consider must-haves in the years ahead. Okay, so that concludes my introductory comments, and now I, you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to step into a role of asking questions of Dave uh, about, his, uh, about his solution in, in, in his, uh, his part of the webinar. And I guess the first thing to consider is, I mean, we're at this point in time, real-time billing is not very very real. I mean, in, in many markets of the, around the world, flat rate is the prevailing way of, uh, of billing customers. And so the first question I have for you, Steve, is are operators really going to move away from flat rate, and will customers actually accept it? Well, first I'd like to thank everybody for joining the webinar. I really appreciate you all taking the time to come listen to us. Uh, then to really answer your question, Dan, I mean, I think you know, the news media in the last six months have almost answered the question for us. Uh, the economics of all-you-can-eat or flat rate pricing are becoming quite obvious. Uh, and I think if you just look at the, the realities of every other economy out there, uh, there's some characteristics of, of all-you-can-eat pricing, which are, which are you know, it make it only work in a very small segment of, uh, of the economies. And fundamentally, you have to have a very inexpensive supply and a naturally limited consumption. And so if you look at your kind of cheap diner mentality, a person can only eat so much, the food is typically not very expensive to make, and so economically the, the restaurant can make money. 
I think if you look at voice over IP, that's somewhat true uh, in that market as well. There's a lot of plans where you can call from the U.S. to Europe an unlimited amount during the month for a certain price. And again, a person can only be on the phone, you know, basically having one conversation at a time. A voice over IP connection is using a few kilobytes per second of bandwidth, so it's very inexpensive to supply. What we've seen happen with all of the smart devices and 3G cards for laptops and uh, you know, all the high-def video that's available now is you have exactly the opposite situation. You have, a, you have very expensive network bandwidth being consumed uh, almost in an unlimited capacity uh, to consume. And, and unfortunately, there is nothing that essentially limits how much a person can use. People can be downloading you know, several, several videos at once on, on some of these devices. And so there, there is essentially no way to economically uh, control your margin and come up with a business model, you, you essentially end up having to overcharge 90% of your people to, uh, to support the 10% that are, that are essentially abusing the service. And I think if you look at the way markets mature, uh, I like to look at the retail market as an example of you know, a, a market that's been maturing for thousands of years, essentially. And, and I think the price of milk is a great example. You know, as markets mature, pricing segments and becomes more and more personalized. So within probably 20 kilometers of where I'm sitting right now, uh, there's probably 20 or 30 or 40 different choices that I have on buying a, a, a gallon of milk. And I can decide to go buy, you know, in bulk from a big box retailer. It's very inexpensive. They're open, you know, 12 hours a day. Uh, I can go to uh, 7-Eleven. I'll pay quite a bit more money, but they're open 24 hours a day. Or I can go get the organic grass-fed cow milk for twice that price. Uh, at, at one of the specialty retailers. I mean, there's just many, many choices, and every single consumer gets to decide which value equation they want, you know, they want uh, to accept. And I think what we'll see is that the, the economics of the data services will drive in the exact same direction. You have very, very different types of people out there consuming bandwidth. We've got us doing this uh, very important webinar, which is very, you know, very critical and business oriented. Therefore, it has very high value to us. Uh, whereas my children watching watching videos on their phone has a very low value to me as the paying consumer. Uh, and so you'll, I think we'll see this tremendous sophistication show up over time where pricing is based, you know, not, not even just on static information like what, what exactly are you doing and what plan have you signed up for, but even more dynamic information like giving discounts during off-peak hours, uh, trying to shape the network traffic uh, in, in order to, to maximize the use of the network and also to minimize the congestion of the network during, during peak times. Uh, so I think, I think what we'll see over time is there will end up being, you know, sort of thousands and thousands of different pricing options, and each person will get to choose where in that they want to live. Now, the challenge that comes with that is if you're going to have a sophisticated marketplace like that, you have to have transparency. And I think you, you, you made your convenience store example. I'll go one further. Imagine walking to a, into a convenience store to do your shopping and nothing has price tags on it at all. And you, have, you basically have to pick everything you want and then you check out and at the end of the month you find out how much you spent. I mean, nobody would even imagine shopping that way, yet that's the situation we've had in the, in the communications market. In order to, to make people comfortable with more, more sophisticated personalized pricing and give people control over their spending so that they spend every penny that you can get them to, uh, you really absolutely have to have a real-time platform for charging and, and policy control. You have to be able to notify them uh, at various thresholds, whatever, you know, whatever they've asked to be notified about, whether it be monetarily based, whether it be usage quantity based, whether it be, you know, service oriented, uh, you know, let, let my kids do this much of that and so much, uh, so much video and so much games. Uh, you have to be able to do advice of charge. If people are going to download an HD movie, they don't really understand how big that is. They, you know, they need to understand how much it's going to cost. And you absolutely have to have the bill shock prevention. You have to be able to cut people off. Uh, you have to be able to warn them before you cut them off so you don't have a bad user experience, give them an opportunity to buy more uh, or select a lower bandwidth or whatever, but then also be able to stop delivering the service uh, so that you're, you're not overcharging them and you're not leaking revenue. And that's really what a real-time 
uh, charging platform offers is, is the total control and visibility over spending. Uh, it gives customers a choice for instance, to select various QoSs depending on how much they care. You know, if I'm syncing my email on my smartphone in the background while I'm in a business meeting, I, I don't really care how, how efficient that is. I don't want to pay for high QoS. Whereas if I'm, again, on a, you know, on a webinar like this, I absolutely need that QoS. Uh, and you know, even much more dynamic offers, again, around network load or location-based services, being able to deliver, to deliver uh, coupon and promotional opportunities based on where you're sitting and, and, and what, you know, how you're connected into the network. I mean, all of that absolutely requires the real-time support. Dave, thanks for that. Uh, Jeremy here, we've now got a, a great opportunity to um, put a question to our audience. And the question we'd like to ask you uh, first is, what do you think will be the most likely pricing structures for mobile data plans over the next three years? Will it first of all be uh, A, continue with flat rate, B, a mix of flat rate and capped bundles for different customer segments? C, uh, uh, metered with volume discounts for power users. D, class of service options with bundles. Uh, or E, data will be free. Just to give you a, a moment to think about that, what do you think will be the most likely pricing structures for mobile data plans in the next three years? Flat rate, mix of flat rate and cap bundles, metered with volume discounts, class of service options and bundles, or do you think data will be free? And remember, your vote is anonymous, so uh, say it as you see it. Right. Let's go and broadcast what we've got so far. What we see here now is continue with flat rate comes in at a very low percentage, but the majority clearly is a mix of flat rate and capped bundles at 55%. That's uh, your opinion. Mix of flat rate and capped bundles for different customer segments. And a class of service options and bundles, that's 32%. So really the, the dominant features there are uh, the answers B and D. Dave, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think it's it's definitely the case that you know those are the two that that are sort of very bundle oriented, and if you look at uh, the way people like to consume <laughs> uh, services like this, I mean, if you look at cable television now, it's all about bundle choices. You don't you don't pick channel at a time. <laughs> it would be kind of impractical. So I think that makes perfect sense that that uh, that there will again be lots of different bundling options for different types of consumers. Dan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, the class of service options and bundles, maybe people are referring to uh, the business customers who I think will want to have um, you know, a better a QoS, for example. They may be alluding to that uh, uh, notion. Excellent. Well, look, um, back to you, Dave and Dan. Yeah. Well, I've got the next question for you, Dave, and it's around, um, you know, I think we need to get more specific at this point and, and actually – uh, you know, explain if you could um, how real time brings value to the to the telecom business. Sure, and and there really are a number of business advantages to real time. I mean, it it is a whole new paradigm for how the operator. Uh, it connects to the subscriber and manages their business. And kind of walking around this, uh, this slide, I mean, the first and foremost is just the tremendously better customer experience. Uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you look at how much control people can have when they can see exactly what they're doing, they can, they can uh, put limits and notifications in on themselves, on their children, companies can put limits and notifications in on their employees and, you know, departments and divisions, um, all of that visibility and transparency is, is very, very powerful to make people feel comfortable spending, spending their money because they don't, they, they don't feel at risk of making a mistake and, and ending up, you know, owning the cost of that mistake. Uh, in addition, you know, obviously Bill Shock's been all over the news, uh, first in, in, in Europe and now in the U.S., 
uh, and and you know that that creates a, a very uh, negative relationship between subscribers and their carriers. Even even though you know in general those are all typically written off as bad debt, uh, it still just creates a lot of distrust. And and any time there's any type of surprise on a bill, you know there's calls into the call center, and and those are you know seldom a, a, an exciting uh, <laughs> opportunity for the subscriber. Uh, so I think you know again giving people the steering wheel to control their their destiny and 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 be able to get advice of charge and alerts uh, just gives them a lot of comfort and I think it creates a lot more stickiness in the relationship uh, with with the service provider because they because they feel comfortable you know people move when they feel uncomfortable or or essentially you, you know ripped off uh, Moving around the chart in terms of maximizing the network investment, you know, obviously tremendous amounts of money are being spent on the network uh, to support all the, the the very high volume data traffic, uh, and and so it's it's extremely important that operators be able to pull as much revenue uh, out of that network investment as possible. And I think you know we we saw a lot of uh, a, a lot of stuff in the news around AT&T's network with the iPhone and places like San Francisco and New York. Uh, running into running into challenges, and so what you see happening is is then you're you're creating customer frustration at very very peak times, and then the network's of course sitting you know essentially idle all night long, and and so being able to offer very dynamic pricing around you know trying to shape traffic and incent people by giving them a, a, a better deal at the more off peak hours, uh, being able to control fair usage policies where you keep. 3% of the people from using 80% of the bandwidth uh, in real time, those are all very, very important to, to allow people to use the network in, in a consistent, reliable manner, and again, to maximize the return on that investment. At the same time, it's very important that operators protect the revenue, and and uh, you know we see a lot of operators around the world that are actually charging for data services using batch uh, rating platforms, uh, even in the prepaid case, because they they simply haven't you know been able to make the move over to real time yet, and and they're they're essentially at tremendous risk. They're leaking tremendous amounts of revenue. Uh, in some cases, we see them being three, four, five days behind on rating these services. Uh, and that's just you, you know huge exposure for them. In addition, by moving to a real-time platform, uh, as, as Dan alluded in the in the conversation with uh, with Steve Jobs, uh, they they have, operators have an opportunity to to move into the higher value area of the billing and charging for over-the-top services. Uh, you know, if you look at companies like NTT Docomo in Japan, they make a tremendous amount of uh, money essentially running a very complex marketplace for content providers and software uh, application providers and collecting their fee uh, in order to run that marketplace. And people are much more willing to buy electronic goods if they can bill it through their mobile phone uh, bill than if they have to enter uh, separate payment information. There's been a number of studies showing that that you know people people do trust their their uh, mobile operator um, kind of more than the random internet company, which makes sense. Uh, and finally, in terms of uh, in, in terms of benefits, it's really about business enablement. I mean, I mean the, the the classic challenge that a lot of operators have is that they ha they are very very constrained in trying to roll out very aggressive marketing plans to try to respond competitively to you know to 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 their competitors uh, rolling out. Uh, bundles and new services, and so they they really need a real time platform to be able to to compete in this in this market today uh, to be able to create new business models the hybrid prepaid postpaid account that that Dan mentioned uh, to do all sorts of value based pricing and really you know create that more sophisticated relationship and hone in on it to be able to to put, to experiment with different bundles and options and see how the market reacts and what kind of people are, are taking it and which ones aren't and how do we adjust the prices and again if you look at the retail market you know there's there's actually studies that get done constantly in supermarkets where they figure out exactly where to put the highest margin items because people are most likely to see them and most likely to to buy them. I mean, that type of sophistication requires the the real time infrastructure. Uh, so I think I think you know fundamentally, I think there's a broad set of advantages for real time. It's really it's really about getting there uh, where the challenge lies. Right. And speaking of 
of getting there, I mean, uh, what are the specific challenges you're seeing in actually implementing the real-time charging solutions? I mean, uh, do you see these primarily as technical issues, or are the problems lying elsewhere? Well, what we're seeing is actually that the, the, the challenges are both technical and kind of more business oriented. And, and if you look on the technical side, um, the biggest challenge that's been out there historically is what we call the efficiency versus complexity barrier. And, and this chart is intended to illustrate that. Uh, if you look at the efficiency of, of charging systems, and that's the, the vertical axis, versus the complexity of you know, the volume of charging they're doing and how complex is the, the actual rating and discounting and, and processing, uh, what you see is that batch systems are fairly efficient because they, you know, they can take advantage of all kinds of, of uh, uh, shortcuts, essentially, that a real-time system can't because the, the input data is not changing while they're running. You know, they, they, they don't have to be transactionally uh, uh, consistent. As soon as you move to even the most basic online processing uh, where you're running transactions, you give up quite a bit of efficiency to manage those transactions and to, and to make sure all the, the correct answers come out at the, uh, in, in the end. And as you add higher volume of processing or more, and more complex processing, the, the performance and efficiency of the charging systems typically continues to drop off. And so what you see happen is you've got kind of these very, you know, very high throughput, postpaid, batch uh, processing systems. The prepaid voice, the classic IN prepaid voice systems are, are quite a bit less efficient. And then if you try to take a very complex uh, a charging platform, you know, that's very configurable and flexible and do all sorts of, you know, value-based pricing and bundling and, and family sharing plans and enterprise pricing, uh, which, which is where the, the, the kind of data and content market wants to go, uh, you run into just increasing challenges around scalability and efficiency. And really what needs to happen to, to create the business case and, to, and to, to incent operators, you know, to really move there, uh, not just from a business benefit standpoint, but also from a cost standpoint, is that systems need to, to become much more efficient for that complex event processing. I mean, you need to get to where you're not paying a penalty to move from batch to real time. In addition, the integration of a real-time system, again, is just inherently more complex. I mean, in the, the classic batch world, uh, the batch mediation system completely isolates the network layer from the rating and billing assets and provides this you know, tremendous buffer where, where you can have complete chaos occurring on the network during peak, peak times. And, and you're feeding that into the rating platform and the billing system in a, you know, in a nice orderly fashion. As we move to real-time charging, uh, the actual charging platform is essentially connected to the network live and is responding to all the authorization requests and, and, and essentially has to manage the transactional chaos as it is being fed by the network in real time. Now, luckily, there are some standards, the 3GPP has done a tremendous job of defining standards uh, between the network and online charging and online policy uh, platforms. But even so, what we see is, you know, in spite of those standards, every vendor still tweaks them a little, still adds some, some attributes that are vendor specific. So, so there is still uh, integration work there, uh, even, though, you know, even though it is a standard. On the back side, feeding from the online charging platform to the, to the legacy billing system or systems is often the case, uh, there really aren't any standards. And so that can, you know, that can be a fair amount of work for, for integration. In addition, if there are multiple legacy billing systems underneath the charging platform, they often have very conflicting data models. So you're trying to roll out you know, a convergent charging platform to sit on top of all these, these billing assets, and you have to essentially reconcile the fact that subscribers are stored completely differently, uh, and the whole data model is quite different in the different systems underneath. Uh, in addition, what we're seeing is that the active mediation uh, technologies that are in the market are just very early in their adoption curve. You know, I think, I think batch mediation has been there forever, 
uh, active mediation, which is the which is the online mediation. So essentially, you know, managing the the normalization of diameter messages off of different network equipment, uh, managing aggregation of the of messages to to reduce the load onto the charging platform. Uh, you know, th those 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 solutions are fairly new in the market and are somewhat underutilized. And so I think it's 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 important that operators look at what active mediation can bring to the table to reduce the amount of complexity to putting in online charging and policy. From a business standpoint, the, the challenges uh, really fall in kind of three categories that we see. One is just fundamentally cost, and that relates to the efficiency that I, that I talked about. Uh, what we hear from operators is that traditional real-time charging platforms are generally seven to ten times more expensive to operate than the batch equivalent. And so, you know, in trying to build a business case to move to real time, uh, you're, you're, you're trying to say that the business benefits overcome that seven to ten fold increase in cost. That's obviously a very difficult sell to any, uh, any CFO today. And so, really, you know, the, the operator needs to be looking more for next generation solutions where that cost difference is, is either vastly reduced or eliminated. Another business challenge is, is around the predictability. Uh, again, you know, these are very complex software systems to be flexible and configurable and to offer all the different pricing options. Uh, the, software, the software offers a, a, a lot of different uh, ways in which it can be configured. And typically, that flexibility creates fluctuations in the performance uh, it creates fluctuations in the, in the latency and the throughput of the software. And again, because an online charging platform or policy platform is talking to the network live, it has to have the predictability of a piece of network equipment. It has to be 5.9's available. It has to be uh, guaranteed in its performance and its latency. And, uh, and it can be very difficult to, uh, to find a solution that can, that can meet that requirement. And then the last issue is, is almost more political <laughs> in, in, in essence, and it's really the, the, the fact that the, these online platforms kind of span the world of network and IT. I mean, historically, any sort of prepay platform, any sort of network equipment was owned uh, in most operators by the network group, and any sort of you know, traditional billing system was historically owned by the IT group. So now you have a situation where the online charging and policy platform is kind of living with one foot in the network and one foot in the in the billing world, uh, and it can be it can be a very interesting uh, effort to build the the consensus and the agreement around sort of who should own the platform, who should put it in, and who should who should manage it. Dave, thanks. We've now come to the moment for our second poll question. Um, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges in moving from batch to real-time rating and billing environments? Political, who owns real-time rating and charging from an operational perspective? Answer B, business case, convincing stakeholders of the value of real-time. Technical, is it difficult to implement and integrate? Or financial, is it too costly to implement and operate? I can see answers coming in um, all the time. One quick run through on that. In your opinion, what are the biggest challenges in moving from batch to real-time rating and billing environments? And let's go to broadcast the answers. Well, we see that uh, the first answer comes in at 39%. It's uh, developing all the time. About 40% are saying it's a political issue, who owns real-time rating and charging from an operational perspective. But not far behind it is the business case which needs answering, and that's convincing stakeholders of the value of real-time. Um, Dave, what's your thought on this? Well, this is actually not, not surprising to me. I mean, I think it is, it is these more elusive aspects <laughs> that are very, very difficult to, again, build consensus around. And, uh, you know, again, in, in terms of the political issue, uh, you know, a lot of the service providers are organized into very much a left side and a right side and, and to try to, to, to sort of draw, 
draw a circle right down the middle, uh, you have very different backgrounds. You know, the, the network side of, a, of an operator is, is extremely oriented around the reliability, the predictability, uh, the guarantees. And the, the IT side is much more oriented around the flexibility and the power of the business solution. So to try to, to, try to bring those two sides together and agree on a, on a single solution is, is inherently very, very challenging. And the business case, I think, is going to get easier and easier over time. I mean, you have operators now writing off millions or tens of millions of dollars uh, in, in bad debt around bill shock, and you know, there, there, there's all the regulatory pressures showing up, and as you said, the dominance of prepaid. So I think, I think the business case historically may have been, may have been challenging. I think over the next two, three, four years, uh, the, the business need for real time is going to become uh, increasingly evident, and, and, and the battle will move more toward the political. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, um, this is Dan. Uh, you know, I'm surprised at how low the financial figure is, and uh, you know, because that's traditionally been the biggest burden or the biggest uh, you know problem for real time being implemented. It's so damn costly to implement a real time billing system. But if folks in the uh, in the audience think that that's not a big factor anymore, then that's really a very hopeful sign that we're actually going to see these systems being deployed. I think in the next few years. And so uh, and that leads me to the next question. I mean, uh, then uh, I think the whole issue of scalability we haven't talked about quite yet, Dave. Um, you know, these new these data services are, are surging, and they're going to you know drain a lot of uh, data usage. I mean, how are you going to be able to handle the load in these systems? Well, again, you know, I think what I, what I mentioned earlier is that the legacy systems are being really stretched to their limit. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of operators we talk to where even their batch rating platforms are not able to keep up with the explosion in the data traffic. And uh, this slide is an example uh, that that we worked with an actual operator, about a five million subscriber operator, on on projecting the load to their charging platform uh, over the next five years, starting in 2009. And, and what you see is, you know, without substantial subscriber growth, this is really just the, the, the increase in smartphone penetration and the increase in usage of those devices, uh, you, you see their, their loads move from about 1,000 events per second back to the charging platform up to about 30,000 events per second, so a 30-fold increase over five years. And so, you know, you can imagine uh, trying, to, trying to use a, a, a traditional system that, that runs on, you know, huge, expensive Unix servers uh, and trying to keep up with that kind of ramp. I mean, you, you, you almost can't build the data centers fast enough to, to keep up with the, the requirement. And so what we see is that really a quantum leap forward in the technology of real time is required to push things over the edge and really make it uh, both cost effective and, and, uh, and efficient to deploy the real time systems and gain all those business benefits. And, so you know what what we've been working on is, is is essentially solving the puzzle of some typically very conflicting requirements. I mean, you're, you you essentially really need a platform that has tremendous business flexibility and configurability, uh, but at the same time you need the, the the platform to be you know 10 times or, or or 20 times or 30 times higher performance than than these charging platforms have been classically. And at the same time, you need the, the network grade uh, qualities around the ability to guarantee the uptime, guarantee the latency, and guarantee the throughput. And that is a very, very difficult technical challenge. Well, let's go to the third poll. And that question is as follows. Is growing mobile data traffic causing any of the following issues? A, bill shock with customer experience issues. B, revenue leakage and credit exposure. C, scalability issues with internal systems. And D, cost control issues. Is growing mobile data traffic causing any of the following issues? And we can broadcast those results now. They're still coming in, but there. I mean, the dominant answer is perhaps not a surprise, Dave. Uh, over 60% are saying scalability issues are predominant. Um, what's, your, what's your feeling on that? Is that as you would have anticipated? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, as I said in the <laughs> a minute ago, I mean, fundamentally, these systems are not the the, the, the traditional solutions in this area are not just a little bit you know, too slow and a little bit hard to scale. I mean, you've got situations where the traffic is doubling every six, eight, 12 months, and, and the systems are, are so expensive and complex to deploy that you, you just physically can't keep up with that growth curve, and not only physically can't, but also just financially can't keep up with that demand. And that's why I think, you, you, you know, essentially a, a real quantum leap forward in the scalability and efficiency is required to, 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 to remove this, uh, this challenge. Thanks. And I would agree. I mean, you know, definitely scalability. I would say yes to all of these things, but uh, scalability is certainly the most important and the, uh, the toughest hurdle to overcome. Uh, but, you know, I mean, going to the next question, um, you know, how are, how are operators going to overcome all of these uh, hurdles uh, in the future, I guess is my next question. Well, again, you know, looking at what type of real-time charging or policy platform uh, service providers need moving into the future, uh, there's really these, these, these specific requirements which are, again, extremely difficult to, 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 to find in a single solution. I mean, historically, uh, the technologies in the market, either the, the network IN-based solutions or more the IT software-based solution, are, are good at sort of half of this problem but not the other half. You really need the, the flexibility, the ability to deploy uh, quickly new pricing, new services, new business models, as well as, as obvious from the, the poll, the, the scalability needs to move up tremendously, and then again the network grade uh, reliability and, and performance guarantees. So, so fundamentally, to, to safely roll out an online charging or policy solution, you have to solve all of these problems, or you haven't really, uh, you, you're, you're not going to get the buy-in from the network, uh, from the business, you know, from all the different uh, stakeholders. In addition. A, 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 a real-time charging platform does have to interact with the systems around it, and I think one of the, you know, one of the lessons that's been learned over the last few years, and the reason that 3GPP has been so active and so successful, uh, is that there were a lot of proprietary architectures, a lot of closed architectures, a lot of proprietary protocols, and that made it extremely difficult to put in a new system. And so, you know, we really feel strongly that 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 you you need a system which has a lot of standards-based interface and is very, very flexible and configurable. You know, the, the network interfaces, while they are standardized, are do vary still from vendor to vendor. Uh, you need to integrate with, with external systems for provisioning of new subscribers and, you know, the, the, the subscriber management aspects. You really need a SOAR XML-based integration layer to make that easy. Uh, you need a very configurable data model. So, again, as I said, if you have multiple billing systems underneath you, the subscribers may look very different and you have a single platform platform that has to be able to handle that. Uh, you want the pricing data to be based on, you know, the SID standard uh, so that it can be imported from the CRM system. The bundles and the, the offers can be imported if, if desired, and you need a very data-driven, very configurable uh, pricing capability. You know, in, in every respect, even the, even the data feeds to the the downstream systems, again, there is no standard there, so you need to be able to feed processed events to the various billing systems or CRM or data warehouse or ERP, and, and that needs to, to, to have a lot of capability around enriching that data and formatting that data to make the integration easier. At the same time, around the scalability, I, I think you know what operators need to look for is first of all move off of the, the the kind of big black box proprietary hardware platforms. I mean, if you look at the cost of a CPU cycle on on one of those large proprietary servers versus a you know versus a Linux uh, inexpensive Linux server, it, it's it's probably at least a factor of ten less expensive to run the same the same instruction. So so you gain tremendous cost advantages just by moving on to commoditized off the shelf, you know, Linux-based platforms, and, and there are now a lot of, uh, you know, sort of network-grade, telco-grade uh, commodity platforms uh, out there. They're, 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 they're very easily available. Uh, in addition, the software has to be able to take advantage of that inexpensive, inexpensive hardware. Uh, again, looking at scalability as the biggest challenge people are seeing, you know, you, you need software that can, that can both run very efficiently on the hardware, but also scale very incrementally and efficiently. So as the load does rise, which it's doing uh, exponentially,
exponentially, you know, you're sticking another blade into a blade server to get the next six months of load covered, not backing up a truck and unloading, you know, $2 million worth of hardware. Another thing that, that where we see a lot of cost kind of, kind of get, get hidden is in the way the redundancy and the disaster recovery and, and, and all that is handled for high availability. Uh, you know, we're, we're big fans of active, active clustering where all the hardware is being used at all times, uh, both from the standpoint of if you're using the hardware, you know that it's running, so you don't have the classic uh, uh, backup generator problem of when the lights go out, <laughs> you discover nobody has serviced the backup generator in a long time. Uh, but in addition, you avoid dark costs. I mean, having, having a whole rack of equipment sitting, sitting uh, idle and just accumulating cost you know, is, is very, very expensive and often not really taken into account. There's also other hidden costs that need to be considered. Um, a lot of the charging platforms out there, you know, as you try to scale them, you have to buy more database licenses. Uh, in some cases, because of the way they're built, how many balances or counters they're tracking can influence the performance. So you have to pay more for you know, tracking more balances. I mean, those are all things that have to be carefully looked at because in the more sophisticated marketplace, you know, you will be tracking lots and lots of counters and aggregations and different kinds of balances for different purposes. You want to make sure there isn't going to be money uh, flowing out the door for that. Okay, Dave, I think you've, you've given us plenty of good reasons to be interested in this technology, but let's talk about the business case. I mean, what are the things that, uh, I mean, the people that are listening to this seminar, uh, they have to sell this idea to senior management. What are some of the things that uh, they should consider talking about to them? Well, our view is that there's, there's, there's a couple aspects to the business case. Uh, you know, there, there's the cost aspect and then there's the business opportunity, kind of the opportunity cost aspect. And looking at the, the cost side of the equation, again, because typically uh, the, the systems are, you know, again, seven to ten times more expensive uh, than the batch systems that they would be replacing. And, and so, you know, you, you really almost can't make a business case out of that. Uh, so, so our view is, is it's very important to understand the total cost of ownership and what we call the CPT, or the cost per transaction, the cost to process a single event. If, if you don't understand how much an event costs, you don't understand how much it will cost to scale the system. You don't understand how much, it, how much cost is incurred as new services roll out and therefore the service margin. And so, you know, we've been working with operators and we've started by analyzing the hard costs because they're much easier to measure. Uh, we are also working with operators on the softer costs like system administration. Uh, but they're, you know, they're a little, a little more challenging to quantify. So, so our view is the first thing to do is sit down and at least make the business case and the hard costs, which are easy to measure and easy to identify. And that really includes things like the hardware, the redundancy, uh, hardware, the software, the, the price of the data center space and the electricity and the carbon credits, uh, you know, the support for the hardware and the software. And, and our feeling is that you really have to look out about five years uh, to do this type of TCO and cost per transaction study because if you just look out a year or two and the volumes are doubling every year, you know, you, you are at risk of making a very, a very short-term uh, decision which turns out to be extremely impractical and, and, and kind of unscalable and unsupportable uh, just a couple years later. And, and so what we've done is kind of built a model, and this is just a sample that we filled in to show the idea, of, of being able to, to build a cost model around these hard costs and this, this spreadsheet is actually based on the 30,000 events per second that was the fifth year uh, uh, requirement, peak requirement uh, uh, in the chart earlier. And so if you look at this, you know, you can, you can add up the total cost of ownership. And then what's interesting is you can take that and fold that into how many events you expect to process out in the fourth or fifth year and figure out what is the cost of those events. And in this example, you see that, you know, you, you, you basically get a fifth year cost. You get to run about 500,000 events for every dollar of hard cost. So that, that type of number, you know, would make an, uh, a service provider very, very comfortable that even though the volumes are rising exponentially, even out four or five years, 
the cost of processing each event will be very, very low. And so it's okay that those volumes are, are, are doubling, and it's okay for the business to go out and, and you know, try lots of new things and generate lots of new events uh, without this risk of incurring massive costs. And these costs have to be predictable. You have to have the guarantees around performance uh, to ensure that, that you're not off. You know, you know a vendor can, can promise this cost and then deliver one-tenth of the, the performance, and all of a sudden you, know, you don't want to be stuck holding that bag. You have to be comfortable as an operator that this is what your hard costs will be. In terms of building the business case, again, we talked about the cost side and the opportunity side. And our view is that to build an effective business case, the TCO, the total cost of ownership, and the cost per transaction <clears throat> really need to be on par or less than the legacy batch cost. As soon as you say you know, to, the, to, to, to the executive management, we want all these great business benefits, <clears throat> it's only going to cost five times as much or two times as much. That's a very uphill battle. It's much more effective to say, you know, there's a cost to putting the project in, but once it's in, the ongoing costs are equal or less than the legacy costs, and then here's all the business benefits. Now you're just, you're just trying to justify the, the transition cost of the platform rather than an ongoing operating cost. And, and so, you know, that makes it much easier to point out all these areas of savings. I mean, you have a tremendous reduction in bad debt write-off and bill shock issues. Uh, customer churn, <clears throat> you know, call center costs. I think most statistics say at least half of the calls to a call center are billing related, uh, as well as closing off any sort of cash and revenue leakage. On the upside, you have the you, you now have a platform that lets you go go find the revenue from your power users. You know, the users that are willing to pay for QoS, willing to pay for higher bandwidth. You can enter the marketplace for over-the-top services and charging and managing those. And again, you can accurately manage your service margins. These are all very, very important aspects to, to selling real-time. It's very interesting, Dave. And um, you know, I think you've understated the case because um, all of these major upside opportunities are bound to be much more valuable than the actual savings from uh, replacing the legacy. But um, you know, I think we're at, the, at our final uh, question here. I mean, uh, are there any other things that we haven't covered that you think uh, we should? Well, my, I guess my final thought would be just that, that moving to real time is a fundamental shift in thinking uh, for operators. And, you know, essentially you are now transparent to your subscribers so you can't hide stuff. You can't a week later change your mind <laughs> you know, and do something and have nobody notice. So, so all the balances and charges are managed in real time. That means, that means a, a, a discipline around managing uh, you know, the pricing tariffs and, and, and understanding what impact that has on the relationship with the customer when you make mistakes. In addition, the whole area of payments becomes much more dynamic. You know, you, people pay in advance. They might pay immediately, weekly, monthly, at a limit. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a much richer interaction with the actual payment area, and, and they may even just buy bundles of assets that don't even, don't even have a, 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 a life cycle associated with them. So the, the, the whole billing process kind of evolves into three different areas. You've got the real-time charging and real-time payments, You've got real-time presentment and, and sort of data analytics, analytics around looking at their usage. And then you have the, the sort of batch processing and payment processing as well. But, but instead of being kind of a monolithic billing system, it really breaks into these different parts. Dave, thanks very much for that, and Dan. Uh, it's a, a really stimulating discussion. It's, it's given us all uh, a handle not only on the market forces, but also how real-time charging can bring value to the business with premium services, and most of all, how to get there. Um, there were a number of questions already in, uh, some great ones from operators around the world. I would love to have more time. We don't. So I'm going to have to ask you, uh, Dave, particularly to answer briefly, if you would. Uh, the first question from someone uh, in well, Western Europe is, you seem to be focusing in on data alone. Is voice dead, or uh, is there a business case for real-time billing for voice products and real-time postpaid? Well, certainly in the case of postpaid, I think, I think real-time is, is you know, coming quickly. I mean, again, whether people are paying in advance 
uh, or not. They want that transparency, that visibility and control. Uh, the reason we focus more on data right now is just because of kind of the chaos in the press around bill shock with the smart devices and, and the, the data services. But, but everything we're saying, I think, applies you know, basically to any service. Uh, voice is essentially turning into data as we move to LTE-based networks. Uh, and so I think you know, there, there, there's, no, there's no implication that voice as a service isn't just as uh, interesting from a real-time perspective. Uh, the next question is from um, an operator in Africa. What's the real reason why OCS and core network vendors are leading the discussion in real time compared to traditional OSS BSS vendors who are rated highly you know, by Gartner? Well, I, I think if you, again, if you look at the the real time charging area, it it is a network grade platform. It has to have the five nines availability. It has to have guaranteed performance, uh, guaranteed latency in order to keep the network running smoothly. And so I think the you know the the vendors that that have the experience to, to bring that type of solution to market uh, are the ones driving the, the discussion. If you look at the more classic enterprise software vendors, they don't have the ability to guarantee that type of, you know, that type of behavior in their systems. They need to make a lot of technological changes to, to get there. And at the risk of getting my knuckles wrapped, I'm going to squeeze in one last question. Um, somebody's asked, have you considered real-time charging as a service in the cloud? We, we, absolutely. In fact, we are uh, we are in discussions to uh, to start offering that at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, for a lot of services where where incredibly tight latency is not as much of a requirement, uh, I think it's a tremendously uh, effective way to to bring it to the market. That clearly was a very topical question. We are now out of time. I like to say a huge thank you uh, to both Dave Labuda of Matrix Software and to Dan Baker of the Technology Research Institute. Um, before we go, can I just remind you to keep an hour free for our next webinar. It's on Thursday, the 4th of November, on how to transform your OSS, BSS systems and processes to enable cloud services. Gentlemen, it's been a, a useful discussion, a really interesting one. And thank, well, thank you, you to our audience, uh, too, for their questions. Uh, so thank you both. And most of all, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, wherever you are. We really appreciate the time you spent with us and hope you have a great day. Bye for now.